Hey, Doc Jones here from the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine, and welcome, welcome. We're excited to be with you uh, for our Comfrey uh, webinar. We're going to be talking about um, Comfrey, Symphytum officinale, and uh, this is really a fantastic herb. One of my one of my favorite plants. If I could only have five plants, uh, this would be one of the five plants. Um, just extraordinarily useful. A um, little bit controversial, uh, a little bit uh, tending to misbehaviors in the garden, but uh, we'll get through all that and talk about it. And so here we are, let's talk about comfrey. So I'm Dr. Patrick Jones. Like I mentioned, I'm a veterinarian. Uh, I'm a clinical herbalist and a, a naturopath as well. Uh, so I have two practices. Um, and have used comfrey a lot uh, in in the veterinary applications and in the naturopath practice with human clients for various things. And uh, like I said, it's just a, a tremendous, uh, tremendous plant. So comfrey is, uh, it's in the Borignales family, um, Borignaceae family. Um, and it's Symphytum officinale is the species we're going to be talking about. There are some other species in this genus, um, and they're, you know, for the most part, have pretty similar properties. But this is the one you always see uh, in the trade. Um, let's look a little bit at the name, because names are fun and words are fun. Uh, Comfrey was named by Carl Linnaeus, and Carl Linnaeus... Uh, was the guy that invented binomial nomenclature in taxonomy. So in other words, um, he's the guy that decided everything ought to have a scientific name. Uh, because he was a scientist, you know, he was a, back in the 1700s, everybody was a scientist and a doctor and an architect and a painter and everything all together, you know, but he was one of those guys. But anyway, um, he was a, a scientist and he would go to meetings with other scientists and uh, he'd never have any idea what anybody was talking about because they were all using their local names for the plants and animals. You know, so the Germans were talking about, you know, Wunderweed, and the Irish scientist was talking about Mary's Tears flower, and, you know, I mean, they were all the same plant, you know, but nobody knew who, who was talking about what. And so he said, we've got to quit doing this. We've got to have a standard language and a standard naming system. And so he invented binomial, two names, nomenclature for taxonomy. And so now we're not humans anymore, we're homo sapiens, right? And your dog is not a dog, or a hunt, or a shen, or a perro, right? He's a canis familiaris. So everybody will know what we're talking about if we go to the meeting. Um, and so comfrey, uh, the name, the common name comfrey actually comes from an old Anglo-English, Anglo-French word, um, which means to heal. It comes from an old Latin root, conferere, which is to literally means to boil together, but they're talking about making medicine to heal people, okay? Um, and so it also has a strong reference to bringing tissue together, to bringing things together and healing, which is what one of Comfrey's primary attributes. Um, it's also the Latin name, Symphytum officinale. Symphytum is from a Greek word too, and that Greek word means grown together. Okay, two things that have fused or healed or grown together. Um, and officinale means from the officina. And so the officina was the little room in the monastery where the uh, monks kept all the medicinal plants. And so, let's see if I can make my thing work here. There we go. Um, so if you see a plant whose Latin name, species name is offic officinale or officinalis, uh, that means that that plant is one that Linnaeus found in the pharmacy in the monastery, okay? <laughs> so in other words, it's a plant that has a really long um, history of medicinal use. So, all right. So... Some of the common names, comfrey is what everybody calls it. Uh, one of the other older names is knit bone, uh, knitting as in knitting a sweater, so we're knitting the bones back together. Um, they've called it 
prickly comfrey, they've called it black wart. Uh, wart is the old English word for plant, so black wart is a black plant. They're referring to the root, the roots are black. Um, but you know, you've got mother wart and fig wart and St. John's wart. Wart means plant. Uh, bruise wart is another plant name for it, another common name, because um, it was good for bruises. Slippery root, black root, uh, wall wart. Anyway, it had a lot of names in the old days. Um, the medicinal parts are the leaves and the root. Um, and it has a lot of constituents that are good. It, it has a lot of mucilage in it, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, it has allantoin, which is a really important chemical for healing. Uh, it has tannins in it, which have some astringency for drying things up. And it has a lot of vitamins, you know, B12, vitamin E, vitamin C. Um, it has inulin in it. Um, and inulin is a plant that... Uh, it's, it's a fiber. It's an insoluble fiber that's found in plants. And it's really extraordinarily important for, as a food source for the beneficial bacteria in your gut. Okay. Uh, we can't digest it at all. It doesn't do mammals any good at all. But the bugs in your gut really like it. And they break it down into simple carbohydrates, which we can absorb, and simple sugars and vitamins and release things out of it. That's good. Um, but... Uh, yeah, inulin is, is really a tremendous prebiotic. So a probiotic is the bugs. You know, you take a capsule full of dried bacteria, that's a probiotic or yogurt or, you know, miso or sauerkraut or any of those kombucha fermented live culture things, apple cider vinegar. Um, those have the actual bugs in them. They're probiotics. But a prebiotic is a plant that contains a fiber that feeds those guys. So if you're going to take a probiotic, it would be a really good idea to take a prebiotic with it and give the guys something to eat when they get down there, right? We have a formula called um, digestive prebiotic, and it doesn't have comfrey in it, but it's got a lot of other guys that have a lot of this fiber inulin and burdock and elecampane and guys like that um, to feed the bugs in your gut, which do a ton of things. We, I mean, that could be a whole other two-hour webinar just on all the great things your bugs in your gut do for you. Um, but if you take comfrey internally like burdock or elecampane or any of the other uh, roots that have a lot of inulin in them um, it feeds those good guy bacteria you, now you have to take the actual plant or a powder of the plant you can't take a tincture or a tea because you're straining all the fiber out which is the whole point right so if you're going to use a plant as a prebiotic you have to take a physical form of the plant, not a liquid extract of the plant. Okay? Okay. So veterinary applications, uh, and I've used this in my veterinary practice all, really a lot, for really a lot of years. I was a practicing veterinarian for 30 years, uh, and we used comfrey all the time on dogs and cats, and uh, it's safe it's as safe for those uh, species as it is for humans. Um, there's some question about whether it's as safe for horses internally as it is for humans. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, topically, it's perfectly safe for any of them. Okay. So you can, you know, put it in capsules. You can make it into a tincture. You can make it into a tea. It has a lot of mucilage in it, and mucilage is the the slimy thick slippery wonderful stuff that's in plants like slippery elm and marshmallow and mallow and hollyhock comfrey has as much or more of that than any of them it probably has more of it than any of them uh, trying to strain comfrey <laughs> when you're making a tincture out of comfrey and you're trying to squeeze the cloth to get the juice to come out yeah it's almost impossible because it's so slippery from the mucilage um but anyway mucilage does better with a cold infusion than a hot infusion and so if you're going to make a tea out of comfrey then it's better to do a cold tea than a hot tea and you, the way you do that is you just throw the comfrey in a jar of water and let it sit overnight that's a cold infusion in the morning you've got a, a cold infusion and you can do a hot infusion which is just a regular tea where you heat up the water and throw the herbs in the hot water um, I don't ever cook the herbs. You know, I boil the water, turn it off, 
throw the herbs in and put a lid on. And then when it's cool enough to use, you strain it and, and make the tea. But um, you can do that with comfrey too, but it kind of goobers up the mucilage. Um, and it doesn't make it less effective, but it does make it kind of goobery and gross looking. And so people have to drink with their eyes closed, right? <laughs> and so plus if you strain it, a lot of the mucilage, mucilage gets lost because it's big clumpy goobery stuff now, right? So if you want the allantoin, which is the chemical in comfrey that makes things heal faster, you know, do a hot infusion, it doesn't matter. If you want the soothing demulcent properties of comfrey, then you're going to do better with uh, a cold infusion. Okay. John Christopher, who was a really foundational North American herbalist down in Utah, and his one of his students, Michael Tierra, who's a great herbalist in his own right now, uh, they were both big proponents of making a comfrey mucilage preparation. Uh, and the way they would do it is they would soak a couple of ounces of comfrey in a quart of water overnight. Then they'd simmer it at a real low heat for about a half an hour, strain all the herb out, add six inches of, six ounces rather, of honey, a couple of ounces of vegetable glycerin, simmer it for five more minutes or so, and then keep it in the fridge. And um, then they would use that as as a soothing mucilaginous medicine for fixing you know, sore throats or guts or anything irritated anywhere in your body. Uh, and just take a couple of tablespoons of that, right? And it tasted good. The honey was nice. The glycerin tastes nice. Uh, comfrey doesn't taste bad. Um, and they would just refrigerate it and use it that way. So that's another good thing you can do. So comfrey, uh, the roots are black. I mean, they're white on the inside, but they're black on the outside. Uh, like I said, one of the names of it is black root or black wart. Um, and the roots go down really a long way. You'll have a very difficult time digging them up. Um, the stems and the leaves are hairy and they're kind of irritating. You know, they're sort of raspy. Uh, and, you know, there's an old uh, tradition in herbalism called the Law of Signatures. And the Law of Signatures says that that God put little hints in all the plants so we'd know what they're for. And, uh, you know, whether he actually did that or whether it's just a great mnemonic device, you know, it works either way. But, you know, yellow plants, for example, typically are very good for the liver, and yellow is the color of bile. You know, red plants are often have activity on the heart and circulatory system. Uh, mullen leaves look like big lungs, you know. Uh, comfrey... If you touch it, it's very irritating. You know, it's itchy and irritated and scratchy and yucky to touch, you know. Um, I mean, you want to wear gloves when you harvest it because it's that ag aggravating. The little hairs on it are just really rough and miserable. Um, and it's saying, I feel really irritated and miserable everywhere. You know, so anywhere that you feel <laughs> irritated and miserable, comfrey will fix it. Okay, it's advertising. Um and so, anyway, the plants get pretty big. Uh, you know, the leaves can get a foot wide when they're fully mature, and, and they can get, you know, a couple of feet long. Um, the plants themselves will get two or three feet tall. The flowers are really pretty. They're not very big, but they're, they're sort of bell-shaped. Um, you can see them here. Really pretty flowers. And the whole plant's full of mucilage. If you break off a leaf, you'll feel that slippery, slimy, mu mucilaginous stuff, you know, you'll know right away. Um, pretty hard to mistake comfrey for anything else. Um, the, the flowers die back, and then they produce this little capsule, and each capsule has four seeds in it. So comfrey is kind of hard to grow. Um, It'll only grow if the seeds touch dirt. Okay, so be a little careful. Um, don't put it in like an asphalt parking lot lot. Don't put it in your carpet in the house. It won't work. It won't work. It's got to be near dirt. Otherwise, it's pretty easy to grow. Um, <laughs> it likes full sun, but it could care less. I mean, I have lots of comfrey growing in full shade. In fact, one of the things I like to do with comfrey is plant it under my fruit trees 
full shade, and I just chop and drop it for a for a mulch. You know, I let it grow up, and then I chop it, and it falls down, and you get this great thick mulch of comfrey leaves on the ground as a weed barrier and as an extraordinary nutrient for the trees. Um, so it doesn't care if it's sunny or shady, but it, but if it's in the sun, it'll grow bigger and wilder, you know. Um, it does like a fair bit of water. So as long as it's getting enough water in nature, in the wild, it'll be near water usually. Um, but it doesn't have to be near water because the roots really do go down forever and it can get water. Um, but it likes water. It likes the soil to be pretty rich. It likes, um, you know, some compost and things like that to feed it and it'll get really excited about that and really grow um, it's very hard to control it's a very aggressive busy happy extroverted megalomaniac okay and so put it somewhere where you want it because you're going to have it um, one way that we have contained comfrey is with this system this is one of my wild comfrey beds um, and as you can see, it's surrounded by four feet of concrete. And this has been um, extraordinarily successful in managing the comfrey. I don't get any comfrey <laughs> in that concrete at all. I do get a lot of it on the opposite side of the concrete because the little black seeds bounce right across <laughs> into the gravel driveway on the other side of the concrete and pop right up and are happy, happy. So, yeah, probably 10 feet of concrete would be better and make sure that the concrete doesn't slope away from the bed. That, that, those are the things I learned. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, be aware that uh, it is very, very prolific. It grows, you know, I planted some comfrey on my place and, you know, realized right away that that was probably a bad idea. And 25 years later, I'm still fighting comfrey in other places on the property that came from that place, you know, seeds that got tracked around or whatever. I was there yesterday and there was a bunch of comfrey, you know, 20 yards from where I planted it that had, some bird had dropped or got stuck to somebody's shoe or something. And so we're still wrestling the wild comfrey. Um, we'll talk about a good solution for that too. So, and that is Russian comfrey. So Russian comfrey is a hybrid uh, it was found in the wild over in the Ukraine, uh, in the Caucasus Mountains. And by the way, if Esther's listening, hi, Esther. We, I have a student in the Caucasus Mountains. <laughs> she used to live in Holland, and now she's living in, in the boondocks of the Ukraine. And how fun. Anyway, um, so, anyway, it, it's a hybrid, and it was found in the wild. You know, and these plants were a little bigger, a little more robust, like hybrids are often. Um, and the botanists got interested and started looking around at it and thinking about it, and, and it turned out that it was a cross between Symphytum officionale, which is regular comfrey, and Symphytum asperum, which is just another species in the same genus. Okay, um, And so they would cross-pollinate and make babies, and the babies were hybrids, and they were sterile. So a lot of times if you get two species in the same genus and they mate, the babies can't make babies. Uh, the classic example of that is a mule. You know, you take a donkey and a horse, which are different species in the same genus. They're both equus. Um, but if they have a baby, you get a mule, and the mule can't make babies. Okay, But he's bigger and stronger and stubborner than either of his parents, uh, but he can't make kids. And so Russian comfrey is is that hybrid comfrey, and they call it Symphytum uplandicum. Uh, that's what they call the hybrid. And they fiddled with it. The botanists experimented with it, and they made several variants of it. And, uh, you know, there were at least 12 of 14 of them, because the good one is, is number 14. They call it Bocking 14. Bocking was one of the botanists that was fiddling with all this, probably. I don't know. Uh, maybe Bocking is, what is Bocking? Anybody know what Bocking is? Anyway, <laughs> I assumed it was, maybe it's, maybe it's the greenhouse they grew it in. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> there's Bocking 7 and 9 and 11 and 14. There's a lot of them. Bocking 14 is the good one. Okay, and that's usually the one you'll find. If you find Russian comfrey, it'll probably be Bocking 14 on the internet. Okay, and next spring we'll be 
uh, selling some root starts and stuff of Russian comfrey so you can grow your own. So why would you do that? Well, you do that because it behaves. Because it doesn't spread by seed. It, it It's sterile. It makes seeds, but they can't grow. You know, they can't germinate. And so you can put Russian comfrey in, and it'll grow like crazy and produce like crazy, but it will never spread. It'll spread very slowly by root division, very gradually over years, you know. But if your patch starts getting too big, dig half of it up and give it to your friends, you know. But it's not going to get 20 yards away and in your neighbor's backyard and in, and in the front yard in the flower bed. You know, it's not going to do that. It's going to stay where it is, and the only way it can reproduce is by, you know, root division. Uh, or if you go over it with a rototiller, which is the best way in the world to spread comfrey. But <laughs> don't ask me how I know. All right. Um, <laughs> any little piece of root that you leave will uh, make another comfrey plant. So, all right. So harvesting, um, the best time to harvest comfrey is when the leaves are really big. You know, a lot of plants, the leaves are a little richer and better if they're uh, younger. But comfrey, that's not the case. They're just as good or better when they're bigger. And they're safer when they're bigger. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the root, you can harvest any time. It's a perennial. Harvest it whenever you want. It might be a little bit stronger in the fall because it's thinking more about putting things underground instead of making things upstairs. Um, but I don't fuss about it near as much as I do with other plants because it's such a vigorous, insanely powerful, good herb. Uh, I don't notice that the roots I dig up in August are any worse than the ones I dig up in October or April, you know. So um, I wouldn't worry about that. I do tell people um, if you are going to harvest comfrey, don't use a backhoe to harvest comfrey because um, if you dig it up with a backhoe, it could take weeks to recover, Okay. Other than that, you can dig up as much as you want, and it'll be just fine. <laughs> all right. So let's talk about safety, all right? Because this is the big question, isn't it? Is comfrey safe to take internally? Um, and I guess the first thing we have to do is decide what does safe mean, you know? If safe means there's no risk of any danger whatsoever, then no, it's not safe, you know? But neither are bicycles or glass windows, you know, or, you know, linoleum floors. I mean, nothing is without risk. Um, you could have an allergic reaction to comfrey. You could choke on a hunk of comfrey. And if you put the slimy mucilage from comfrey on a linoleum floor, heaven help you. I mean, you're going to get hurt, you know. You're, somebody's going to slip and break their neck. So <laughs> there are a lot of very dangerous applications for comfrey. Um, but... The real question is, seriously, can you take it internally and not and not damage your liver? That's the real question, okay? There's a lot of concern about comfrey because it contains uh, chemicals called pyrrolizidine alkaloids. And there's a lot of those, and some of them are very dangerous, and some of them aren't very dangerous, okay? Comfrey has several of them. Uh, most of the ones comfrey has are less dangerous than the ones that some other plants have, okay? And so... Comfrey's not the worst of the worst, but it's got them, and so we worry. Okay, there's other plants that have them too, uh, and so we worry a little bit. Um, but let's uh, let's go here. They have done some studies, and this is where we're going to get into some consternation, I'm afraid, as some of the studies are really stupid. Okay, they fed rats in one of the studies six week old rats were fed comfrey as 40 percent of their diet now it wasn't comfrey the plant it was an extract of the plant a concentrated extract of the plant 40 percent of their diet for six weeks that's all they got for six weeks was you know half of almost half of what they ate 40 percent of what they ate was a concentrated comfrey extract and some of those rats got liver tumors okay well so what does that mean? Well, that means it is absolutely not safe at all to take comfrey internally as 40% 40, 40 of your diet for six, is if you're a rat, long term, right? And they did it for like a year. It wasn't like they gave it to them for three days to see what would happen. It was a long-term study, okay? 
So yeah, don't do that. It's scientifically proven not to be safe to take comfrey as 40% of your diet long term if you're a rat. Now they did another study with pigs and they fed them comfrey extract as 40% of their diet. And guess what? The pigs didn't have any liver lesions at all. So the question is, are humans more like pigs or are they more like rats? And I guess it depends on the human. You know, but anyway, that's another subject for another webinar, I guess. But are people like pigs or are they like rats? Some people are like both. Some people aren't like either. Anyway, it gets complicated. But um, <laughs> the, the, the fact is that livers, I'm a veterinarian, okay? And I'm here to tell you that the livers of different species are extraordinarily different. If you give a dog grapes, it can kill him. What? Yeah. If you give a dog uh, xylene, uh, xylitol, the sugar substitute that's in peanut butter, it can kill him. An artificial sweetener. Why? Well, because dog livers turn grapes and xylitol into really poisonous chemicals. They have some enzymes and pathways they send them down that turns them into something very deadly for the dog. If you give a dog grapes um, or raisins, Sometimes, not always, which is also weird. Sometimes it doesn't bother the dog at all, and sometimes it kills him. I had a client that has a, a vineyard, and he brought his dogs in, a big golden retriever, dying of kidney failure, right? And I said, holy cow, he didn't get into the grapes, did he? Because that's what happens. They eat the grapes. The liver of the dog turns the grape into a toxin that's excreted by the kidneys, and on its way out the door, it kills your kidneys if you're a dog, right? I says, he didn't get into the grapes, did he? And the guy says, what are you talking about? He eats grapes all day, every day he eats grapes. He loves grapes. Are they bad? <laughs> so here's a dog that had been eating grapes all the time, and all of a sudden on that day they were poisonous. Well, why is that? Was that because something was going on with his liver that was funny? Or was it something that, you know, today the, alcohol, the chemical in the grapes that he was going to turn into something bad was higher because it was sunnier, or they got a bigger drink, or they didn't get a drink, or something happened to the grape? Who knows? Right? There's a million variables. But the point is that livers are very different. And using an animal model to study something about the liver and applying it to humans is a little bit crazy. And I realize that we that's all we can do. We're not going to round up 100 people and give them comfrey as 40% of their diet. Right? That would be a bad idea. Um, that's why we don't have good data on a lot of herbs about their safety in pregnancy is because you don't dare give them to pregnant ladies to find out. That would be dumb. And giving them to a rat doesn't tell us anything, you know, definitive about humans. It says maybe, could be, possibly, hmm, they're mammals, we're mammals, maybe there's a connection, right? But it's not a, a definitive thing. And I'll tell you another thing, as a veterinarian of 30 years, I've had a lot of rats that were clients and patients, right? Well, usually, well, some of my clients were rats, but mostly they were nice people. None of them were pigs. Anyway, we're getting back to that confusing part. Uh, <laughs> I had a lot of patients that were rats, all right? And I'll tell you, uh, the only thing that I ever saw a rat for was cancer. Every single rat in my practice, honest engine, every rat, pet rat that anybody ever owned in my practice died of cancer, usually very young. So why is it we're using rats as a cancer model? I don't know. Oh, and by the way, the problem that comfrey causes in humans isn't liver cancer. It's veno-occlusal disease, which is a completely different thing. But we're using the rat study to say that comfrey is dangerous for humans. Because it could be that if the rat human has a liver of a rat, he could get a t rat tumor in his rat liver. You know, it's, it's, it's just silly. Okay, so anyway... These are the problems with research, and, I, and I'm a published researcher, you know, before I became a veterinarian, I wrote some scholarly peer-reviewed articles, you know, but the, the um, fact is that the model is flawed always, and the researchers know that, they do, and they're not saying, usually, if they're good researchers, they're not saying, we know this definitively about everything because we know it about this thing. They're just answering this one question, will lots of comfrey hurt a rat? And the answer is yes. Okay, I'll give them that. But the answer is not, therefore, a lot of comfrey will hurt a pig. Therefore, a lot of comfrey will hurt a human. They didn't ask that question. 
They didn't explore that question. They didn't research that question. Okay. So there's flaws with using research as an absolute. You know, I think we should use it as a guide. I think we should use I use it all the time. I, I study medical journals, articles, and I've got a son-in-law who has a PhD in physiology who works for Homegrown Herbalist, and I call him the herb miner, you know, and he's digging into the deep research of what cytochrome does this herb inhibit, right? And what alkaloid does this herb contain? Because if it inhibits this cytochrome, gee, how come I'm not using it for that thing too? You know, and we come up with all kinds of application for herbs that herbalists don't come up with because they don't do the research or have the background to even understand their, what the guys are saying in those papers. Um, there's only three or four English words in each of those papers. Uh, <laughs> and so, anyway, research is great. I love it. You know, it's a great tool. But you have to understand some studies are very specific about a very specific question, and you can't generalize that to mean other things, number one. And number two, uh, some studies are horrible and badly done, right? And then there's the third thing, and that is the case study. So let's talk about some case studies. So, oh, well, here's one. So horses, here's a case study, all right? So a case study is different. A case study is when I say, uh, this happened. I had a case where this happened, all right? And we make inferences from that which is good. I mean, that's, you know, I've been using, for example, I've been using teasel root in people with MS. And I've only used it in seven or eight people. And every single one of those people has had remarkable results. Well, those are seven or eight case studies. All right. That is not definitive, absolute research. That is not a, a statistically uh, significant sampling of humans. Seven people, seven or eight, maybe it's eight. Anyway, you see what I mean? But I'm certainly going to give it to the ninth guy that comes in with MS because it worked on the other eight guys really really well. See, that's a case study. So um, one of the problems with case studies is they have even more variables and more unknowns, right? And we'll get into some of these. Let's look at some. Okay, so here, uh, David Christopher. So, they, so there's a plant called hound's tongue. All right, it's a wild cousin of comfrey, and it has more pyrolizine alkaloids in it than comfrey does. All right, and David Christopher talked about a case once, and David Christopher is John Christopher's son. All right, he's a good herbalist. He's running the, the Christopher Herb School. Very nice guy, and a, and a smart guy. Anyway, he had a case of a bunch of horses that he got called out on that were really sick because they'd eaten hound's tongue, which is a cousin of comfrey and has a lot more paralyzing alkaloids than comfrey. And they were getting really sick. And he gave them a liver formula. And all the horses immediately rallied and got lots better. One horse uh, that didn't get the herb formula died. So what if we established? Well, unfortunately, we don't really know, you know, because it's not a controlled study. What else were the horses eating? I don't know. Did they get a big shot of some chemical de-louser or dewormer the day before that stressed their liver? I don't know. Were they eating all kinds of other plants with the hound's tongue that also had pyrolyzine alkaloids? I don't know. Were they eating other plants that interfered and tied their liver up so it couldn't process the pyrolyzine alkaloids? I don't know. So what do we know? Well, we do know that he gave an herb formula, a liver support formula, to a bunch of the horses and that they immediately looked and felt better and recovered and that he didn't give it to one of them. One of them didn't get any and that one died. So we don't know anything there either. But certainly if I was treating a horse that had eaten a lot of hound's tongue and was really sick, of course I'm going to give him liver support herbs, right? Because on the face of the case study, it looks like that really helped those horses David worked on and it probably really did. Okay. And I'm bet you a nickel he'll do it next time and it'll work again. Right, but it's not a controlled study. Um, so there have been some cases where humans did have liver damage, uh, which may have related to using comfrey internally. All right, and we're going to look at some of the studies, but understand that these cases really are rare, 
And in most cases, no effort is made to determine if there were any other factors that these people had in common. You know, uh, there was no investigation of other food additives or other pharmaceuticals or other things that pathologies of the liver. You know, were their livers healthy in the first place? I don't know. Were they taking drugs that were stressing their livers out? I don't know. You know, we just don't know. And the problem is that the researchers didn't look in these case studies that I'm going to show you. And these are some of the case studies that they use to say, hmm, here we have a, a scientific study. Well, first of all, no, we don't. We have a case study, not the same thing. Not a controlled study where the only variable is comfrey, right? It's a case study where we have 100 variables we're not exploring. Uh, but they but they often use these case studies as proof that, that we got a problem. So let's look at one. Let's look at a few of them. We got a scientist for this. She'll help us. Okay, so here's a study, all right? And, and you can go read these. Here's the listings, the references. Okay, this is a study. The title of the study, Hepatic, which is liver, Hepatic Veno-Occlusive Disease, so liver disease, veno-occlusal disease is, is the liver disease that is associated with comfrey sometimes, associated with comfrey ingestion. All right, this is in the Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology in 1990. So just a summary, a 23-year-old woman was hospitalized for fever and malaise. Malaise is weakness, you know, feeling lousy like you feel when you have a cold and you feel lousy, weak and tired. Hospitalized for fever and malaise. A diagnosis of veno-occlusal disease was made, okay? So they diagnosed that she had this liver problem. Medications were administered. Oh, it's a man, not a woman, I'm sorry. Uh, a liver shunt was surgically placed, and the man died of liver failure a week after his surgery, okay? No serum analysis or liver specimens were evaluated for the presence of pyrolizidine alkaloids or their metabolites. So... He has the disease, he has venoclusal disease, but they didn't analyze the blood or the liver to see if there were any pyrolizidine alkaloids in the blood or the liver. Okay, but it gets better. The man's friend reported that he had consumed comfrey one to two weeks before his hospitalization. It was never determined if this was true or whether the plants consumed actually were comfrey. There was also no determination made of how much was consumed or in what form. The man was also a heavy marijuana user and had a binge drinking disorder. Okay, so so the title of the article is Hepatic Veno-Occlusive Disease Associated with Comfrey Ingestion. And the reason they know that's true is because his friend said that he thought he ate some comfrey a couple of weeks ago. They didn't even go to the guy's apartment and get the bottle and see if it said comfrey on the bottle. All right? They didn't test what was in the bottle to see if it had comfrey in the bottle. All right? I mean, <laughs> but, the, but the title still blames comfrey. That's astounding to me. That that could be published in a peer-reviewed publication is astounding to me. You know? Um, anyway. Also, the guy was a heavy drug user. What other drugs did he use? Did they do things to his liver? I don't know. You know? So, um, we can't scientifically blame Comfrey for the cause of this guy's death based on hearsay evidence. You can't do it. All right? All right. Just because the guy's friend said he took Comfrey a couple of weeks ago, he thinks maybe. I think that's what it was. Oh, well, let's write a scientific article about it. That's just silly. Okay, here's another one uh, from the journal, the American Journal of Medicine. Oh, that's a fairly reputable publication. Comfrey herb tea induced hepatic veno-occlusive disease. Okay, so there's another person that's got bad liver trouble, and they're saying that comfrey tea did it. Here's a summary. A 47-year-old woman was diagnosed with veno-occlusal disease. The disease was diagnosed four years after a period of taking excessive amounts of comfrey. During a period of over a year, the woman drank 10 cups of comfrey tea and handfuls of comfrey pepsin tablets daily. The woman had symptoms of abdominal pain and fatigue prior to ingesting the comfrey. 
Both of these can be symptoms of venal occlusal disease, okay? It was never determined whether the comfrey tea she was drinking was comfrey at all. The diagnosis wasn't made until four years after the comfrey had stopped. All right, so at least this researcher is saying could be. We don't know. All right. Maybe they should have put in the title may have been caused by instead of blaming it outright. Um, but the lady also had possible symptoms of venal occlusal disease before she ever started taking comfrey. She had, you know, the the fatigue and the abdominal pain. You know, maybe that was, maybe she already had it before she took the comfrey. Now, um, we really don't know if the comfrey, comfrey contributed to her condition or not. It may well have. I really don't know. My point is, we really don't know. You know, now, I would say taking 10 cups of comfrey tea and handfuls of comfrey capsules every day for years is a really bad idea. You know, I can count on one hand the herbs I would do that and not worry a bit, right? Maybe two hands. But, but for the most part, herbs are medicines, and you take them when you need them because there's something going on, Okay. Now, some herbs are nutritives, and some herbs are tonics, and you can take them forever, and who cares, and that's great. You know, take burdock every day for the rest of your life. That would be the best thing in the world for you. But, you know, don't take Oregon grape every day for the rest of your life. You know, don't take uva ursi every day for the rest of your life. Don't take, you know, comfrey 10 glasses a day for the rest of your life. That's just a bad idea, you know. So um, I do think in this case with this particular lady that that long-term excessive dosing was reckless and, and a bad idea okay but we can't say with certainty that comfrey caused this problem because they didn't ever analyze to see if it was really comfrey number one and we don't know if she had the problem before she took the comfrey number two okay all right here's another one hepatic veno occlusal occlusive Start over. Hepatic veno-occlusive disease associated with the consumption of pyrrolizidine-containing dietary supplements. All right? And this is in uh, Gastroenterology, which is another journal. Okay. Summary. In this case, a 49-year-old woman consumed six capsules of comfrey pepsin tablets daily for four months. She had also taken Mu-16, which also contains pyrrolizidine alkaloids, for six months. All right. Well, at least this guy's not blaming the comfrey in the title. He's saying the pyrrolizidine alkaloids probably had a problem. Okay. But he's not saying it was certainly comfrey. Um, because comfrey wasn't the only potential source of pyrrolizidine alkaloids. Um, so I'll give him credit for that one. Um, but again, long-term use, high doses, probably a bad idea. Okay, I'm, I'll go for that. I'll accept that. All right, here's another one. Uh, Veno-occlusive disease of the liver secondary to ingestion of comfrey. Here again, we got the smoking gun is comfrey. Um, British Medical Journal, 1987. 13-year-old boy was treated for liver enlargement and abdominal swelling with prednisolone and sulfasalazine. This treatment seemed to help, and the medication was discontinued. He was then treated with acupuncture and comfrey root tea. Exact strength and frequency are unknown, but the course of treatment lasted more than two years. A flare-up of Crohn's disease led doctors to prescribe more prednisolone. After two years of this therapy, he was again hospitalized for the same symptoms he had initially, fever, abdominal pain, and swelling. Liver biopsy showed veno-occlusive disease. Okay, so here we have a kid who went to the hospital with liver enlargement, abdominal swelling, and pain, and fever. They put him on some medications, prednisolone and sulfasalazine, both of which are liver toxic, by the way. Um, they don't cause venoclusive disease, but they're hard on the liver. Uh, then the guy went to an acupuncturist for something else and took comfrey, and he was under the care of that guy for a couple of years. Nobody knows how much comfrey he took during that time. Then he got Crohn's disease, which is an autoimmune disease, and he went back on prednisolone. And a couple of years after that therapy daily, 
he went back to the hospital again with the same thing he'd had at the beginning of the story, which was abdominal enlargement and abdominal pain, abdominal swelling, and they diagnosed him with menoclusal disease. So, um, what does that tell us? I don't know what it tells us, because we don't know how much comfrey you took during the two years you took comfrey, and it was several years after he took the comfrey that he had the problem, and he had the problem before he ever took any comfrey. Right? So there's all kinds of variables that we don't know. You know, he's got a systemic autoimmune disease. That's not good. He's been under a lot of pharmacology ingestion. That's not good. Uh, did those things make it so the comfrey was more dangerous? Uh, I don't know. We don't know. Um, I do think that the take-home message is that using comfrey internally on a client with liver disease who's taking liver-damaging drugs is probably a really bad idea. Okay, I don't use comfrey on people that are on pharmaceuticals. I don't use comfrey on people that have any liver issues whatsoever. Okay, I don't use comfrey in really high doses for really long periods of time. Okay, I do use it all the time for lots of other things and haven't had any issues. All right. Okay, so I think what we really need to do is a risk-benefit analysis, you know. I'll tell you, I have been using comfrey a lot over the years in my veterinary practice and in the naturopath practice too, and I've never had a single issue, all right, never a single issue. And I can't say that about any of the pharmaceuticals I've used as a veterinarian. There's not a single drug that I've used as a pharmac as a veterinarian that I can't say, oh, yeah, this happened to this one guy, you know. I mean, that's just the way it is. And I, didn't, I haven't had any life-threatening, serious, you know, horrible reactions. Pharmaceuticals, for the most part, are pretty safe. And if you use them right, they're very safe. And if you use the right one for the right reasons, you know, you don't have trouble, mostly. All right, most of the pharmaceuticals have pretty wide margins of safety. Um, that said, I've still had, you know, some issues over the years with pharmaceuticals, some side effects and things. Um, I talked to lots of herbalists. I've never heard any of them tell me a story of some poor guy that had a bad situation because of comfrey. Never heard it. I talked to thousands of people a year. I go to conventions and I speak in rooms with really lots of people in them. And they come up afterward and tell me their herb stories and ask me questions. And they never tell me comfrey stories. You know? Um, that's not true. I got, I'm sorry, that's not true. I did have one guy that a jar of comfrey fell on his head. He was reaching up in his herb cabinet and a big jar of comfrey fell down and hit him on the head and cut his head. But he put comfrey on it and it healed right up. So, But there, there was that one story. Uh, if you combine large amounts of comfort with gravity, you can have some issues. But other than that, I haven't heard any trouble. Um, so we just have to do the risk-benefit analysis, okay? You know, ibuprofen, I talked once with the head of internal medicine at the Mayo Clinic. He's a pretty smart guy, right? Who said, if we knew then what we know about ibuprofen, it would never have gotten through the FDA. <laughs> but we're still taking a lot of ibuprofen in the world. And people aren't having much trouble, right? And so why is that? Well, it's because the benefit outweighs the risk. You know, millions and millions of people take ibuprofen and don't fall over dead. Once in a while, they do fall over dead, which is unfortunate. And maybe we ought to know that and think about not taking it because who knows what else it's doing. But the fact is that for most people, they take ibuprofen and their head quits hurting. And that's all, you know. Um and if it's used carefully and in moderation, not in excess, you don't get stomach ulcers and you don't get liver failure and you don't get all these other bad things that can happen with that drug, all of which are on the label. You know, I mean, they're honest. Truth in advertising, at least. Um, but uh, anyway, in my assessment, and again, it's not a statistical sampling. It's not a blind, double-blind study I've done for the last 30 years with Comfrey. But I've used a lot of it. And in my assessment, the benefits outweigh the risk. I haven't seen any negative effects. Okay. All right. So is it safe? Where does this leave us? You know, well, I think it's safe to say that we shouldn't uh, take...
comfrey is 40% of our diet, especially if we're rats. I think it's safe to say um, that we shouldn't take it long term. I think it's safe to say that we shouldn't take it if we have liver trouble, right? Shouldn't take it if we're taking a lot of pharmaceuticals, I think. Um, I don't use it in pregnant women. I don't use it in nursing mothers. Uh, I don't use it in people with liver problems. I don't use it in people that are taking a lot of pharmaceuticals. I don't use it in people that have really bad diets, right? Because their livers are probably mad too, okay? But I do use it pretty liberally in a lot of other cases and, and don't have issues. Okay, so um, frankly, I think that the healing properties of comfrey are, are such that it passes the risk-benefit analysis with flying colors. And frankly, if you're worried about it, um, here's some things to know. First of all, the big old leaves have less pyrrolizine alkaloids in it than the young leaves. Uh, and the leaves have less in it than the roots, okay? They did a study, um, four studies, in fact. David Hoffman wrote a fantastic book. He's an herbalist. He wrote a book called Medical Herbalism. It's a very good book. Um, and they, he mentions four studies in that book that were done looking for pyrrolizine alkaloids in comfrey. And they didn't find any. None of those four studies found any pyrrolizine alkaloids in the comfrey they studied. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, that means there's a lot of variability, okay? Uh, some studies I've seen show that, you know, these plants had it and the ones across the street didn't. You know, and maybe it's like the grapes that the dog ate and all of a sudden they were poison. You know, maybe on a good day they have more than they do on a bad day or vice versa. I don't know. Who knows? I don't ever, the comfrey plants have never told me how this works, okay? Um, generally, they do say the root has more than the leaf. Generally, they do say that the little baby green leaves have less, more of it in them than the great big leaves. And they say that the Russian has a little bit more than the regular comfrey. So uh, if you wanted to reduce risk absolutely as much as possible, you could use the big leaves instead of the little fresh ones. You could use the big leaves instead of the root. Um, you could use leaves from Symphytum officinale instead of from Russian comfrey. Uh, if you wanted to do that, you could do that. Also, you could use it topically. And honestly, most of my comfrey use is topical because that's mostly what I'm doing with it is wounds and broken bones and stuff. Um, I do use it internally, but topical use is really safe. I, I mean, I don't even think about, you know, I don't care if the guy even has a liver if I'm going to put it on topically, okay? It, it just doesn't, enough of that stuff doesn't get through to, to matter. The chemical that does matter, the allantoin, which is the chemical in comfrey that heals tissue and uh, accelerates cell division, that one goes right through the skin. But the pyrrolizidine and alkaloids, they've done studies on this too, they're hardly absorbed at all through the skin. So that's, a topical use is safe, okay? All right. Okay, let's talk about something else about comfrey. So comfrey is really great in the garden. Um, you know, comfrey makes things grow and makes things heal and protects things and encourages things. And it does the same thing to plants that it does to humans. You know, it makes us, makes their cells divide faster and grow better too. And so it's a phenomenal fertilizer. It's a phenomenal compost source. Um, it also has really deep roots, so it pulls up all kinds of little micro minerals and micronutrients. The plants have a hard time getting, brings them to the surface. And now we make compost out of it and it puts them back in the dirt and the other guys can have them, right? Really a great nutrient recycler. Um, has a ton of nitrogen, a ton of phosphorus, a ton of potassium, a ton of calcium. Really a good micro mineral source for the other micro minerals too. If you put it in your compost pile, it'll activate and stimulate that compost pile. If you put it under your fruit trees, like I was saying earlier, you can do a chop and drop, you know, where you just let it grow, chop it down and let it fall and just makes this wonderful weed barrier and tremendous nutrient. Um, you can take a comfrey leaf and wad it up into a ball and poke it in the dirt when you're planting a seed. Put it in the hole with the seed. And it'll feed that seed and it'll explode out of the ground and grow like crazy. All right? It's a really good fertilizer. You can also make a comfrey tea for your plants. And what you do is you take uh, a bucket or a trash can 
and um, you fill it up with comfrey leaves and you fill it up with water and you let it sit for a month or so and it gets really stinky and gross and vile and horrible but it's that's okay <laughs> that's okay because the stuff that matters is still in there and then you take that tea and you water your plants with it and they just love it to death it's packed with nutrients and it's packed with allantoin that makes things grow faster right and so if you want to really ext and you can do it straight or you can like cut it in half with water if you want and do that too if you want it really powerful you pack the comfrey leaves in there as tight as you can and fill that with water and then put a rock on it or something to keep it all submerged and let it sit for a couple of weeks and it gets really dark and thick and you know you can dilute that like 1 to 15 with water and use it the same way you know if you want to make it in less space and then just dilute it later the other thing that tea either of those teas you can make a spray out of it and spray the plants and and it inhibits powdery mildew and all kinds of other diseases it strengthens and invigorates the health of the plants so you know you have to strain it first or it won't go through the spray nozzle right but uh that's cool too you know, that's another thing that it's that it's good for. Okay, so let's talk about some herbal applications. So the first thing is mucilage, all right? And mucilage we talked about earlier. That's that slimy, soothing, great stuff that's in, you know, slippery alum and marshmallow and all those guys have a lot of mucilage in them. Comfrey has tons of it in them, in it, okay? And it's really soothing to irritated mucous membranes. So that could be in your gut, you know, if you got gut inflammation and irritation, if you got a bladder infection, your bladder's all irritated and mad, <clears throat> you know, if your prostate's irritated and mad, if your lungs or your throat or your mouth are irritated and mad, take some comfrey and it'll soothe it, or marshmallow or slippery elm, any of those mucilage guys will soothe it, okay? Um, like we said before, mucilage likes cold water a little better than it likes hot water, so a cold infusion's better. Um, you can do a hot infusion, but it's, it looks goobery and gross. It's harder to get people to drink that. So like we said, it's really good for sore throats because of the mucilage. Okay? It also has some anti-inflammatory properties, which also makes your throat quit hurting. So that's nice. So sore throats, canker sores, mouth sores, anything owie and sore, and also wounds in your mouth, you know, uh, post-dentist owies. Um, you can just swish the tea around in your mouth and it'll heal things up. And this is the tea that I make. It's equal parts of comfrey, calendula, and licorice. All right. And you can just make a tea. Uh, or if it's a, a local thing you want to heal up, you can just put it on topically as a tincture on that mouth sore or whatever it is. Comfrey is also really good for the guts. Um, and the stomach, it's quite good for ulcers of the stomach. Um, and... I combine the comfrey with some calendula, which is an antibiotic and an anti-inflammatory, to kill the bugs. So comfrey accelerates healing, right? It has a chemical in it called allantoin that makes cells divide way faster. And so you put that in. Uh, you put some calendula in for antibiotic and anti-inflammatory. And then I put some licorice and some chamomile in, too. They've got good properties for that, too, for ulcers. Um, and I would do that three times a day, a couple of teaspoons of that. It's also good for intestinal stuff, and that can be just irritation and inflammation of the guts. It can be diarrhea, but it can also be ulcerations of the bowels, you know, uh, ulcerative colitis, things like that. Um, the allantoin in the country really accelerates the healing of those ulcers, and the mucilage just makes everything feel better. It also has some anti-inflammatory properties like we talked about. So that makes, you know, you can use it for irritable bowel syndrome. Um, you can use it for colitis. Uh, it's got some astringency. It's got some tannins in it. So if you have some mild intestinal bleeding, you can use it for that. Uh, and it has that inulin fiber and the mucilage in it, which are also good bulking laxatives. You know, so you can use it for constipation. So really good for gut stuff. Wounds, it's amazing for wounds, and this is, you know, what I've used it for a ton in my veterinary practice and my naturopath practice. Um, 
all kinds of wounds. And, you know, if you want to see some wound cases, go to homegrownerbalist.net, click on the blog article, and or do a search for wound or something. It'll pull up some blog articles. But we've had some astounding wounds in the veterinary practice, and Comfrey's a rock star for healing those up. It, it, it has that allantoin in it, that chemical that accelerates cell division rates. Okay, so it makes cells divide faster. Comfrey is like smooth jazz and chocolate for cells, right? And <laughs> they start making babies. And so um, it really, really is phenomenal for healing wounds. Don't use it on a puncture wound. It's not good on puncture wounds because it'll heal them too fast and then you get an abscess. But any other kind of wound or burn, Comfrey is astoundingly good for healing them up, right? Um, you can also do a, a tea or a tincture of comfrey. I think that's in the next thing, isn't it? Yeah, here we go. So, um, oh, this isn't what I was talking about. Anyway, th here's, a, here's a couple of recipes. One is for a skin lotion that's like the best thing in the world for your skin. And it says on there how to make a lotion. Uh, we won't take the time to go through that in detail. Um, but I also use it, you can also use it for a wound irrigation tea because it's really soothing and it heals and it's anti-inflammatory. Mix it with a little calendula, some cameos, some cleavers, things like that. Any one or all of those may do into a tea and flush a wound out, you know, to clean it out. Um, you can also use it as poultices for wounds. And I used to do this all the time. I was like Mr. Poultice for a long time. Uh, and the poultice is just a formula with assorted ingredients. The main one is comfrey. And you can throw other stuff in there. You can throw in some calendula, some yarrow, you know, for infection and antibiotic and anti-inflammatory. Uh, you can pull some, put some plantain in for pulling poisons out of it. You can put some ground flax in to give it some body to pull stuff out mechanically. You know, there's other herbs you can put in the poultice. But the comfrey is the one that's accelerating the healing the most. Some of those other guys do a little of that. But comfrey is the big shot. Um, and I always just put it directly on the wound. And it works really well. If you want to, here's a case you can look at. I should have warned you. Cover your eyes if you don't like this. Uh, this is a nice lady. She had a big tumor on her head, and they cut it off surgically, which was a brilliant idea. I'm all in favor of making cancer go away today. That's a good idea, right? Um, but she called me then and said, oh, you're not looking. Here it is. Now cover your eyes. <laughs> Sorry. Um She called me and said, hey, I got this big wound on my head. They want to do surgery. They want to take skin off my bottom and sew it to my head. What do you think? And I said, well, hon, I think if you do that, you'll be the butt of a lot of jokes. And you'll regret it in the end, right? <laughs> um, plus, you'll look like Friar Tuck for the rest of your life. So let's not do that. I said, if you put weeds on it, uh, you'll have a scar that's about a centimeter wide and about an inch long. That's what I usually get out of something like this. And so that's what she did. She poulticed it. And I think it was... I'm trying to remember how long this was, three or four months, if I remember right. But that last picture is the, the after, okay? And if you go to my website, go to homegrownerbliss.net, go to the blog, and you can see the progression of this wound, you know, day by day or week by week, I guess, uh, how it closed up. But, you know, that's a manageable comb over, and that's mostly comfrey that accelerated the healing and made that wound go away. Comfrey can also be used as an eye wash. Um, just make a tea and strain it. And then, uh, you know, I'd do a cold infusion. And then get a little eye cup. You can buy these on Amazon. They still sell eye cups. Or go to an antique store. They'll have them. You fill it up with the tea, and then you put it on your eye and lean back. If you don't have an eye cup, just stick your head in a bucket or a bowl. If you're going to do that for a long time, um, you know, use a snorkel because uh, it's not safe. But uh, that would be one instance where comfrey is not safe, is if you submerge your head in a bucket of comfrey water without a snorkel. That I, you know, I wouldn't do that either. Do it three or four times a day. And, you know, you could put some chamomile in this or some calendula. That would give you a little more antibiotic function. So that would be good too. Comfrey is good for respiratory stuff. It's a really good expectorant for getting goobers out of the lungs. Um... It also, because it's got some astringency, some tannins, it can help if you've got a little bit of mild bleeding. It's not like what I would use for internal bleeding from an accident. But if you're coughing really hard and you're getting a little mild bleeding, take some comfrey. That'll fix it. 
Um, the mucilage, again, like we said, is also really, really soothing. If you've been coughing all day for a week, comfrey is very soothing, as is slippery elm, as is marshmallow, anybody with a lot of mucilage. Okay, broken bones and other injuries like that. I've used this so much in the veterinary practice for this kind of thing. It really makes all the tissue cells reproduce faster. Fibroblast, chondroblast, osteoblast, anybody who's making anything in your body uh, will make it faster and better if they have some allantoin on board, which is the chemical that's in comfrey. And that allantoin is so little, that molecule is so tiny, you can put it on topically. You can put a comfrey tincture on topically or just grind up the plants and slap them on as a poultice. But you can do a comfrey tincture topically and that allantoin will go right through your skin like wind through a screen door. It doesn't even see your skin. You know, it'll go right into the deep tissues and heal the stuff up. <clears throat> In fact, um, I don't ever poultice anything anymore, hardly. Almost never. Uh, what I almost always do now is I get my poultice formula, which is called poultice. Uh, I buy the tincture. I make there's a tincture version of the poultice formula. Um, and you can just put that on directly, or you can just put straight comfrey tincture on directly, and it'll heal wounds and broken bones and things. If it's an open wound, I mix it with some water because the alcohol in the tincture is too zingy for an open wound, right? So if it's an open wound, I'll put a teaspoon of that tincture in two to four ounces of water and make a wound spray and spray, 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 and things heal right up. I don't poultice anything anymore, hardly at all. Uh, but if it's not an open wound and it's just a broken bone or, or a wound, something like that, just a straight comfrey tincture applied topically will heal it right up and you don't have any of the internal use risks. So that's good. Comfrey is also, like we said, it has some anti-inflammatory properties, some analgesic properties. Analgesic just means it makes stuff quit hurting. Um, so it's a good, you know, for sprains and bruises and twisted elbows and arthritis and gout, you know, things that hurt, comfrey topically can have some pretty remarkable anti-inflammatory properties and can be pretty good for pain. Most people don't think about it for that, but it actually is quite good for that. Comfrey is also good for bladder stuff. Again, it's astringent, so it can, if you got a little bleeding from the bladder, it can help with that. Uh, if you have bleeding from the bladder like you mean it, Go get, find out what the heck's going on, you know. Uh, but some people just get a little of that sometimes if they get a bladder infection or something. Um, so it can help with that. <clears throat> and also that mucilage is also very soothing to irritated, angry bladders. Comfrey's also, there's some studies that show that comfrey can st help stabilize blood sugar levels. So that's good. Um, I probably wouldn't use it for that. Because you'd be using it long term, wouldn't you? See, and I wouldn't do that. Um, there's lots of other herbs that can help with blood sugar levels. Uh, I have a formula called pancreas. I think it's called pancreas blood sugar formula or something like that. Anyway, it's it's for helping to control blood sugars in people that aren't on insulin. Um, anyway. I probably wouldn't use comfrey this for this long term because I wouldn't use comfrey for anything long term. Comfrey is also good for the liver and gallbladder. Uh, if, if there's inflammation from a bile duct problem or a gallbladder problem, comfrey can really help. Uh, again, the anti-inflammatory effects and the mucilage both are very soothing for that kind of stuff. You can also make it into a sitz bath. It's really good as a sitz bath for you know hemorrhoids or postpartum tears after childbirth stuff like that it's going to heal that up faster and it's going to make it feel better and i just combined equal parts of comfrey calendula plantain and rose petals and make a strong tea out of it and you know put it in a basin and sit in it and, it, and it'll heal things up really wonderful for postpartum ladies for healing things if they have tears you can also use comfrey in your cows. Uh, you can make a comfrey tea. Um, so you take the tea, and you, just a regular tea like you'd make it, strain it, and then mix it with propylene glycol, which you can buy at the feed store. 
And they did that with mastitis cows, uh, and they did a study, and most of the cows were completely resolved with two treatments. So that's interesting. Um, you can also use it topically for cut tits or chap tits on cows. Um, you can also use it for uterine infections. That was what metritis is. Okay. So you use the same formulation that we were just talking about for the, for the mastitis, and you infuse it into the uterus. Um, and so if you have a cow, you probably know how to do this or know a guy that knows how to do this or your vet does it or your breeder does it or your herdsman does it but you know basically you thread a pipette into the uterus and squirt the stuff in with a syringe um, and it had a good effect on metritis uh, so there you go why is that well it's anti-inflammatory and it makes things heal better and when things are healed better and there isn't a raw surface to get infected it doesn't get infected right all right There is, uh, hound's tongue is a cousin, a wild cousin. We've talked about this earlier with the horses. Um, Cyanoglossum officinale. So this is a cousin of comfrey. It has more pyrolizine alkaloids in it, a lot more, apparently. So I wouldn't use this one internally. I would use it topically. Um, but topically, it would work just as well uh, for all the wound healing and uh, other healing comfrey nice things. All right, so just to wrap up, comfrey really is a rock star, fantastic plant. If you don't have comfrey growing in your yard, you're crazy because it is a tremendous, tremendous herb, really a remarkable plant, amazing resource for your garden, amazing resource for your health, amazing resource for your wound. You know, it would be really great if you had some comfrey growing in your backyard so that when your dumb brother-in-law whacks his leg open with a machete while he's out chopping stuff up on the apocalypse, you could heal up that wound, you know. I mean, it was just a really valuable wound uh, treatment plant and really valuable for all the other stuff we've talked about. Um, like I said at the beginning, if I only had five plants, this is one of the ones I'm going to have. If I only had three plants, this is one of the plants I'd have, okay? Um, so anyway, uh, appreciate you listening. And uh, let's take uh, just a, a minute here and uh, we'll answer questions that you've got in the chat box. If you haven't put your question in the chat box yet, put it in there and we'll answer it, okay? So we'll just take a, just a quick minute break. People can go stretch their legs for a minute. Thank you. 
Hey, we're back. So it's time for the uh, Q and A. Um, so I'm going to scroll up to the top. Whoops. <laughs> now I'm scrolling up to the top. All right. So if you have questions, type them into the little chat box thingy over there, and we'll and we'll answer all the questions. Um, and uh, just thanks again for watching tonight. We so appreciate your participation. Mostly, I really appreciate that you are interested in learning how to use these wonderful plants to help folks. You know, I, I, I don't want us to be the generation that drops the ball, you know, so the next generation has no idea how great these things are. Um, so if you enjoyed learning about this, I hope you'll share that information with people. I hope you'll tell people you love and friends and, you know, maybe send them a link to the video so they can learn about comfrey. Um, I don't know how that works. I'm sure there's a way to do that. <laughs> Surely YouTube has a way to push a button somewhere and share things, don't they? Anyway, um, if you're over 50, just tell your friends to go to YouTube and do a search for homegrown herbalist and comfrey. They'll find it, okay? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so uh, just going to the top here of the comments. Um, just lots of folks saying hi and... and uh, where they're from they're from all over the place wow um okay so here's so sherry p says would comfrey be good for sprain for a sprain or for ligament repair absolutely right for two reasons first of all it's got good anti-inflammatory properties so if you get a sprained ankle you can put put it on topically and it'll hurt way less um if you tear the ligament uh you can also put it on topically or take it internally um but the topical would work just as well. Uh, and it'll accelerate the healing of those fibroblasts and chondroblasts and all those other guys that are making ligaments. Okay. So absolutely. It's, it's the premier herb for healing any kind of tissue damage. It's just really astoundingly good. All right. Um, let's see. Our case, it's amazing on sprains. Uh, I'd guess it cuts the healing time by at least in half. Yeah, absolutely. It'll shorten up the healing time of the injury and it'll decrease the inflammation. So, you know, you could, how would you do it? Well, you could get the tincture and you could, what I would do if I had a sprained ankle, the quickest way to make it quit hurting and, and start healing it up would be to get the comfrey tincture and put a spray top on it and spray it, you know, frequently throughout the day. Um, and we sell little amber bottles with little screw on tops and we sell little screw on tops for our own tincture bottles uh that's the way i do it and it works really great okay um pruitt homestead says hi and says pruitt homestead says we love comfrey my wife makes a salve yeah it's really a phenomenal salve um if you don't know how to make a salve or a lotion you know we won't get into that that's a whole nother thing but well, it's in my book. Go buy my book, The Homegrown Herbalist. It'll tell you just how to do that. <laughs> or better yet, sign up for The Homegrown Herbalist School. I talked about making lotions for about an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> not everyone can talk about something, you know, three minutes of information for an hour and a half. It's a gift. So <laughs> anyway, comfrey in a salve is amazing. It's soothing. It's healing. It's anti-inflammatory. What else do you want in a salve, right? Okay. Um Bionic Starchild says, my rabbits love comfrey, especially the stems. Yeah, they do. We used to feed it to rabbits. I used to feed it to my goats, and they go crazy for it. My chickens would eat it. Uh, yeah, it's really a good uh, a good source of feed. Um, Pruitt Homestead says, my wife did a poultice in a broken toe, and we were blown away with how quickly it healed. Um, absolutely. I mean, I have had so many wound cases over the years in the vet practice. And in the nature path practice too. Um, and lots of fractures in the vet practice. I mean, dogs are better than anybody at getting something broken. Um, and the comfrey markedly accelerates the healing. It markedly reduces healing time in fractures and in wounds. I mean, it's astounding on soft tissues, but the fractures too. Um, so yeah, we do it topically and internally on a serious fracture case. And uh, with the wounds, we're mostly just doing topical stuff. Um, all right. 
What does that mean? Oh, Sheldon just became a member. Thank you very much. That's sweet of you. Evan's pointing things out to me here. You know, we appreciate it. If you, you can become a member of the YouTube channel and that just sort of helps us support what we're doing. And you can also subscribe and then you hear about fun things we're doing. That's fun. All right. But yeah, thank you very much to the, to the folks that are members. That's a real blessing. Okay. Um, RK says spit poultice is my preferred way to use it. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Or just grind it up. It's plenty slobbery by itself. All right. Uh, Derek says, if only I could keep the deer away from my comfrey. Yeah, no kidding. All right. Um, uh, all right. And we did the toe already. Deborah says, uh, referring to the law of signatures, Don Tolman wrote a, a large two book set, the pharmacy desk reference pharmacy with an F pharmacy. That's fun. Uh, she says, that's a good book. I'll have to look at that one. That's fun. Okay. Um, Deborah says, I didn't know that. We don't know what she didn't know, but we're glad she knows now. Thanks for coming, Deborah, and learning that thing, whatever it was. Uh, <laughs> I agree, RK says. It's truly amazing. No longer get lingering backache or any other ache like that. Takes a day or two to feel 100%. Yeah, so we're probably talking about the anti-inflammatory properties. Yeah, it's really good for pain from inflammation. Um, very, very good. I get lots of people telling me that. You know, I, I talked about doing these, you know, big lectures and big groups and one of the things people tell me a lot is I had a really bad sprained ankle or really bad whatever pain and put comfrey on it topically or did a soak or a poultice or whatever and it made it feel way better. Um, I think in a local pain thing, it's better topically than internally because more of the allantone and the anti-inflammatory stuff and all the good guys will go right through the skin, you know. All right. Um, it's a more direct approach. Okay. Um So Deborah says she looks forward to getting that from you, Doc. I don't know what that is. Maybe the PDF? Did I tell you that ever? I hope you haven't been furiously writing things down because I would be happy to send you a PDF of all the slides. I usually say that at the beginning. I think I did. Anyway, um, yeah, send me an email at info at homegrownherbalist.net and I'll send you the slides. And you don't have to write everything down. Info at homegrownherbalist.net. Uh, also, if you have a question that didn't get answered or whatever, holler at us. We're nice people. We'll answer. Okay. Um, Michelle Krantz says, does borage have the same properties as comfrey? I grew some this year for the first time. It's already growing seedlings. Borage does not have the same properties. It's in the same family. It's in a different genus. Um, and I've never used borage. Uh, I remember years and years ago, I looked at it and thought, hmm, should I do that one? And I it didn't do anything. I didn't have 10 other guys doing. Uh, so I didn't bother planting it on my place, but borage is in the same family as comfrey in the Borgnaceae family. Um, I know they use it for fevers. I know they use it as a diuretic for bladder infections. I know they use it, uh, for depression in some people. It's got some calming sort of sedating, make you feel better things. Um, but no, it's not the same critter as comfrey. All right. Uh, Ann Brasher says, my Russian comfrey is spreading a lot. Uh-oh. Um, well, it will spread by roots division, you know, by root uh, growth and expansion. Um, maybe what you need to do, Ann, is get some of the seeds and plant them. And if little comfrey plants come up, they sold you the wrong thing. That might be what's going on, too. Um, unless it's strictly local, you know, in the bed you planted it in and... and uh, I don't know, maybe it just really likes your dirt. <laughs> I've been growing it for a lot of years and it, it behaves pretty well. It spreads a little bit. It, it's not crazy like the other stuff. Okay, Bionic Star Child. How do you know which balking comfort you have? Our property has tons of it. I have no idea which one it is. Uh, most of the balk, most of the Russian comfort that's being sold is balking 14. I've, I've never seen any of the others sold. Um, so if it, I mean, if they say it's Russian comfort, it's probably Bocking 14. Um, and it certainly should be sterile if they're calling it Russian comfrey. 
So Rosa said, I've never grown comfrey. Well, now you know how. Poke the seeds in the dirt and it'll grow or buy better yet. A root start of Russian and uh, then it'll behave better. Jupiter Mojo, unless Jupiter is Hispanic and then it's Jupiter Mojo. Uh, so I don't know. Anyway, uh, top five uses of comfrey for an equine. Well, that's a great question. People always say, you know, how can I use herbs in my horse or in my cow or in my dog or in my ferret? And the answer is you can use them exactly the same way you'd use them on yourself. They do all the same things. Okay. Veterinary herbology is almost exactly the same as human herbalism. I mean, there's a few minor, minor differences. Um, some things are not safe for a dog. You know, uh, some things will make your cat, you know, if you give catnip to your cat, you might as well give LSD to your cat. I mean, he's <laughs> he's tripping. Okay, don't let him operate heavy machinery. Won't hurt him, but don't let him operate heavy machinery. Uh, but, um, and some herbs are not, you know, in high, you know, onions are bad for dogs. Uh, grape leaves and, or grape skins and grapes are very bad for dogs. Um, grape leaves are probably bad for dogs too. I need to look into that one. But the grapes will kill them uh, sometimes. Anyway, so, but for a horse, from a practical standpoint, I've done horse work with comfrey. It's always wounds with horses. That's what I use comfrey for. But if you had a lot of inflammation in a horse and you wanted to do some tincture topically, you could sure do that. Um, but most of what I do for horses is, is wounds. Uh, you could also use it on a fracture in a horse if the horse has a fracture that you're not going to put him down for. Um, all right. You can feed it to your horse too. They like it. Sh uh, RK says you can use it as a chop or chop and drop fertilizer. Yeah. Oh, Ro oh, she's talking to Rosa, I bet, who's never grown fertilizer. I mean, comfrey. Yeah. We planted it under our fruit trees on the other place. I haven't done it over here yet. We just moved here a year or two ago. I have no concept of the passage of time, by the way, just so you know. I, I noticed as I was thinking about it that I said that I planted comfrey 25 years ago on my other place. It probably wasn't 25 years ago. It could have been last week. <laughs> Cause it's all the same to me. <laughs> so, actually, it must have been at least 10 or 15 years ago. <laughs> Probably closer to 10 that I put the comfrey in. But anyway, uh, it's still out of control. That's That was the take-home message. All right. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, we, we planted it under the fruit trees, the Russian. And uh, yeah, you can just chop the, chop it right off at the dirt. And it'll flop over and makes this great weed barrier, great mulch, great, super nutritive. It's an extraordinary nutritive for this, as it breaks down into the soil. Okay. Um, Sam Black, will you be able to ship to Canada in the spring when your comfrey's ready? Uh, I ship stuff to Canada all the time from the store, you know, books and tinctures and things. I don't know what the laws are about shipping a live plant to Canada. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we'll look into that, I guess. Um, or maybe we'll let a Canadian look into that. They know who to call. Um, anyway, but it's not a live plant that can be invasive because it's sterile. So maybe it doesn't matter. We'll have to check. Deborah Cisneros says, Doc, you're such a card. Yes, I, I always wanted to be a king and I ended up being a joker. But anyway, uh, <laughs> at least I'm a card. You know, it's good. all right. I could have been an ace if I had an airplane. That would have been fun too. But anyway, Joker works. Okay, Maria Owen. Never heard of Comfrey before. Thanks for sharing. Just starting learning. Just found this channel today. Wow, Maria, we're so glad you're here. How fun. Love to have you. There's lots of other videos. Go watch them. You can learn about other new friends that you didn't know you had. Um, Comfrey really is a great plant. And we're certainly glad. If you're going to learn your first herb, boy, that's the one to learn. That's a great one. Okay. Avery Kempf says, speaking of mucilage, is Rose of Sharon a type of mallow? Uh, Rose of Sharon is a type of mallow, sort of. It's in the same family, Malviaceae. It's in a different genus. It's in a different tribe. But it has very similar properties. It has that mucilage, uh, and it works really great for those kinds of, same kinds of things. Um, Derek says, Rose of Sharon is a hibiscus. And in the Mallow family. That's right. Rose of Sharon's the the Rose of Sharon is in the Malvaceae family, 
which is Mallow and Marshmallow and Hollyhock, all those guys. It's in the Hibiscinini tribe, and it's in the Hibiscus genus. So it's in a different tribe than Mallow and Marshmallow, but they don't shoot arrows or be mean to each other. They're very friendly, um, uh, and it has very similar properties. Okay, um, and Deborah says it's in the Hibiscus family. It's in the Hibiscus tribe, but it is in the Mallow family. All right. Um, and Deborah says, don't you just love those studies? Aren't they great? <laughs> science is great. Uh, science is great. And I mean, I, I got to say, I like science. I mean, I was a published, I wrote a couple of research papers, peer-reviewed papers before I, you know, became a herbalist. As when I was a veterinary student, uh, I was actually going to do a PhD. I, I was going to do, I did my veterinary degree and I was going to do a PhD and the nice guy I was going to do it with fell over dead on Thanksgiving Day, getting the turkey out of his oven. He's about my age now, younger. He's probably about 45. Anyway, I never got around to doing the PhD because I went into practice and the rest was history. I think that's kind of what the good Lord wanted me to do anyway, so I did it. But anyway, um, anyone know what we're talking about? Oh, science. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he was also less senile than me when he died. But anyway, <laughs> there's wonderful research on herbs, you know. Um, and we do a lot of that. You know, I love getting into the research and finding, you know, that uh, this plant attaches to cannabinoid receptors. And well, shoot, if it does that, it would be good for this. You know, and, and getting into the depths of the research is one of the reasons that, that we learn cool things at Homegrown Herbalist. I've got uh, my son-in-law, Brandon, uh, Dr. Brandon, uh, is a PhD in physiology. And he works for us um, doing herb research. We call him the herb miner, you know, and so he's figuring out, you know, which cytochrome does that inhibit and what, you know, and all these little mi micro tidbits of glorious data that we can then use to say, well, holy cow, why am I not using that for fibromyalgia? You know, holy cow, that would work on a sore throat, you know. Uh, anyway, really interesting. Go to Google Scholar, you know, Google's dumb but google scholar is cool and type this latin name of the plant and you'll find all kinds of great studies you'll also find some really crappy studies <laughs> and that's the other advantage of having a research and medical background like i do and a pure brilliant research background like brandon does is we can look at a study and say yeah adorable like the studies we did tonight never should have been peer-reviewed and passed i mean really you know some of them anyway uh okay so avery yes you can use uh rows of sharon flowers and leaves though you use marshmallow and mallow okay um yeah so ann brasher here's this is interesting ann brasher says two labs on the ranch love grapes they love them okay so let me tell you a story i had it i think i told this in the thing didn't I I can't remember anyway I have a client who has a vineyard he grows grapes for a living and he brought me his golden retriever dying of grape toxicity right and I says to him he didn't get into the grapes did he and he says he eats the grapes all the time he eats grapes every day what are you talking about doc and I said grapes are can be really really toxic and what we learned and what I've heard and learned since is not every grape is toxic to every dog every day right so it has things to do with the plant you know we we talked about comfrey sometimes they can't find any pyrrolizidine alkaloids in those plants but these guys have it right and so is it that they only have it during certain times certain growing conditions or certain temperatures or certain days of the week i don't know same thing with the grapes that dog been eating grapes for a long time didn't bother him at all and that day it about killed him now the good news is that I treated him with herbs and he had a full recovery from his kidney failure. So that was nice, but, <laughs> but I didn't use grape leaf to treat him. So anyway, <laughs> and I didn't use comfrey. We used some other fun things, uh, nettle seed and chamomile. We have, I have a formula called kidney builder is mostly what we used. Anyway, um, there are some herbs that restore and help and fix kidneys, help what you got to do what it needs to do. Um, they can't reverse, you know, some of the irreversible damage sometimes. But if you catch something early in a toxicity case, you can turn it off and fix it uh, sometimes with that. 
And even if you have significant kidney trouble, they'll make what you have work better. Those kidney restorative herbs, uh, astragalus, chamomile, nettle seeds, a, a really good one. Um, look at that kidney builder formula, those guys. Okay. Um, okay. Derek talking about Rose of Sharon, I think still says that, um, that it's edible. Yeah. The flowers and the leaves are both edible on Rose of Sharon. All those Malvasia guys, mallow, marshmallow, those guys are all edible. Um, Avery says, I learned from Stacy from the channel off the grid with Doug and Stacy that I can eat the flowers. Yeah, there you go. They're good. Um, Derek watches Doug and Stacy. Okay. Avery says, okay. He's still talking to Derek. I think that's good. Okay. Christy is comfrey good for gout. Absolutely. Topically as an anti-inflammatory. Absolutely. Um, I wouldn't take it long-term internally for a long-term problem. Right. But if you're having a gout flare up, you could take it internally, but it would work just as well topically. Why not do that? Um, there's other things that would work too. <clears throat> uh, hops, pine needles. You know, there's a lot of things that are good for pain, but comfrey is certainly one of them for inflammation. And a lot of what happens with gout is inflammatory. That's why you're having the gout. It's you got those urea crystals and everybody's irritated and mad at them and you get inflammation. Um, while you're having your gout issue and treating the owie with some comfrey or some you know, hops or skullcap or pine needles or something fun for the topical pain. Uh, you also ought to be doing some things to make your kidneys happy, you know, to excrete the urea better so you don't have your uric acid crystal formation. Um, we have a formula uh, called uh, G period, O period, U period, T period which stands for good overall urinary tonic. It just coincidentally rhymes with some other words. I'm not sure why, but anyway, that would be a good one to look at. Uh, <laughs> but any of the diuretic herbs, you know, dandelion, parsley, burdock, you know, a lot of those guys just help your kidneys do their job better and get rid of the urea so you don't have uric acid. Um, anyway, shoot me an email. I'll send you a link to that formula if you want. Okay, I don't know if we even sell that formula anymore. Go ahead and look. Okay. Um, if we don't, I'll send you the recipe. How about that? Okay. So Ewa says it's great fertilizer, phenomenal fertilizer. We talked about that. You can make that tea. Uh, we talked about that or even just chop it up and put it in your compost. It's fantastic. So Sabrina says, if you have seven people with MS and all seven have great results, isn't that a hundred percent success rate? <laughs> just because you didn't treat a thousand, uh, doesn't mean I got a, a poll just came up and I can't see just because you didn't treat a thousand people doesn't mean your success rate isn't a hundred percent. Well, that's true. I mean, <laughs> the success rate has correlated 100% with using teasel. <laughs> I could say that, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, certainly I'm going to try it on the eighth guy. All right. Teasel root in my experience, in my limited, tiny experience with a limited, tiny, sampling of humans with ms teasel root has been astounding uh so there you go all right oh here's dr brandon rose b rose 04008 that's uh that's dr rose that works for us my son-in-law very smart guy the smartest thing he ever did was to marry my daughter jenny lee i mean that if that doesn't show you're a genius i don't know what does <laughs> Because she's amazing. Jenny Lee was our customer service lady. Most of you probably know Jenny Lee. She was fabulous in that role. But now she's, um, I'm having her teach and write and do stuff. She's really uh, working a lot in the school. Oh, Jay just became a member too. Thank you for doing that. Very sweet of you. All right. So what did Brandon say? Interesting tidbit on pyrolyzine alkaloids. Harmless in and of themselves. It's when the liver transforms them into pyrolizidine esters that they become toxic. Yeah, and that's so often the story with toxins. Uh, antifreeze is completely harmless unless your liver turns it into other things and then it melts your kidneys, right? And so the treatment for antifreeze, the veterinary treatment for drinking antifreeze, is we give the dogs booze because your liver enzymes would rather break the booze down than break the antifreeze down. And if there's booze in there, They'll break down that and ignore the antifreeze, not turn it into something poisonous, and it just goes out like it should as antifreeze, ethylene glycol, right? 
anyway, yeah, the, the main problem with many poisons isn't that they were being rude in the first place, is that your liver turned them into something else, you know, breaks them into the parts. And one of the parts is a chainsaw, you know, and so that's true. Okay, Laurie says, thank you for taking the time to do this for us. Well, thanks for taking the time to listen, Laurie. That was sweet of you, and we appreciate the participation. Okay. Um, Laurie, Donna says, what time did it start? It started at 6 Mountain Time, but it'll be here forever. Unless YouTube goes away. Could that happen? <laughs> it'll be here till the apocalypse, all right? It's recorded, and it'll be the video will be on there. You can watch it later. Tell your friends about it. They can watch it later, too. Okay, um, okay, farmer and Adele Aker says, Tylenol and many things in excess would damage your liver too. Water would damage your liver if you drank enough of it, right? You can die from about anything. Um, but yeah, a lot of pharmaceuticals are very, and I'm not bashing Tylenol, so that they don't need to sue me for saying bad things about them. Let's not say Tylenol. Let's say acetaminophen or ibuprofen or prednisolone or prednisone or sulfasalazine or I don't know, whatever. there are about a thousand drugs that can be hard on your liver, you know, um, and that's okay, but you don't want to take them in high doses long-term because that's can be a problem, right? All right, but anything you eat or drink in excess can be, a, you know, like I said, you can die from drinking too much water, right? Okay, Lana says, hello from Minnesota. Thanks for all you're doing. I like Minnesota. I lived in, I went to veterinary school in Indiana and then I went and practiced in Minnesota for several years. I was in uh, Spring Valley where Laura Ingalls Wilder lived from uh, whatever those books were called. Oh, Little House on a Prairie. <laughs> oh, anyway, we got another member, Anna joined. Thank you, Anna. That's, or Anna, I don't know if it's Anna. It says A. Maybe it's Albert. Amber? Evan says it's Amber. Thank you, Amber. Who is the J? J Energy and Amber have become members of the channel. We so appreciate that. That's kind of you. Okay. Um, yeah, so Minnesota's great. Oh, yeah. And they're... Uh, our case is too much water can kill you too. So there we have it from two authoritative sources. And that is true. You can die from drinking too much water. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. All right. There, yeah, the guy was a drinker in that study. That's right. Thanks for your information. Let's zip through some more of these and find a student. There's some students. Find some more questions. Uh, watched you for the first time a month ago, and I'm hooked. Want to do your course. Lots of love from Australia. Well, from, from Truffle Schnuffle. Fun. I have a lot of students in Australia. Um, I have a lot of students in a lot of places, but for some reason, I have really a lot of them in Australia and South Africa. Um, I don't have any in Antarctica. We're doing outreach to the penguins. I'm not sure what's the matter with those guys, but every other continent, we got a lot of students and some countries we have heavy concentrations and Australia is one of those. It's funny how many of the weeds are exactly the same. You know? <laughs> Anywhere that Europeans went has the same plants. <laughs> so I don't care where you live. All right, you'll find the same kinds of plants we're using here in North America. Okay, um, Linda Ray, I drink. Sabrina says, I want to take the course saving up for it. Well, we're really excited for you to come. There is a payment program on there. Uh, I don't know who's doing it, but there's a button you can click and do a payment program. It's less money uh, all at once anyway. Um, we'd love to have you. I drink Comfrey Infusions, Linda says, and take Comfrey Tincture occasionally, both. I took pain medicine for close to 20 years for fibromyalgia. Last year, I weaned myself off the medicine and started using Comfrey. Yeah, there's a lot of things that we can do for fibromyalgia uh, that are herbal. Um, and that's really great, Linda. I'm glad you're feeling better. That's fantastic. Um, seems like I did a thing on autoimmunity. I don't know if that was a paid thing for the school or if it was a YouTube thing on autoimmune stuff. I can't remember. All right. Um, it's certainly, we covered a lot in the school. Okay. Uh, Desiree is a student. And then Sabrina's asking about highlighting and responding. 
Isabella wants to be a student. We'd love to have you. Holler when you're ready. Um, what would you use Comfrey internally for? Okay, so what would I use Comfrey internally for that wouldn't work topically? Okay, uh, stomach ulcers, um, ulcerative colitis. Uh, if you wanted it as an expectorant, I wouldn't use it topically. Um, otherwise, topical use is going to work for most of the other stuff we do with it. Um, bladder infection, you know, bladder inflammation, you can use comfort. You can use marshmallow for that too. I get the same result um, because of the mucilage. So that's the things I would use it for internally only versus topically. Ulcerative stuff in the gut that you want to heal up uh, as an expectorant. Um, bladder inflammation, that's going to work better internally. Gut inflammation, that's going to work better internally. Okay. Okay. And became a member. That's fun. Okay. Um, here's a gal that says, I have a friend that has, or I don't know if it's a gal, prayer opens doors. I have friends I would like to help with fibromyalgia. They're desperate. There are lots of things we can do for fibromyalgia. Um, we talk about it a lot in the school. That's a whole nother three hour lecture. Um, but there are things we can do. Uh, shoot me an email. The first thing I do with any kind of an autoimmune case, the first thing I do is I address leaky gut. Go to the blog, go to homegrownherbalist.net and go to the blog or just go to homegrownherbalist.net and do a search for leaky gut and you'll find some articles about leaky gut. And we have a kit, a leaky gut kit that has a protocol. Um, but the first thing I do with any autoimmune disease is address that. And nine times out of 10, that improves things a lot. And then we can go from there if that's not enough. Um, but go to, yeah, go to homegrownherbalist.net, do a search for leaky gut, read the articles. Um, and certainly if you're in the school, go to the lectures on the lessons on immune system and autoimmune stuff and leaky gut. There's two or three or four lessons on that just kind of thing. Okay. Uh, Sabrina says pain takes so much energy from us. No kidding. Right. So much, so much energy and joy is taken by pain. All right. Um, what do you think about the effectiveness of Comfrey Sab? I think it's fantastic. Really great for your skin. Really great for uh, achy arthritis, hands, things like that. You could put some other fun things in it too. Okay. Deborah Cisnero says, Doc, you're too much. That is true. That's why we only do one hour YouTube videos. We don't do three hour ones because that would be too much. And certainly you shouldn't listen to them while you're driving. <laughs> Lots of things are bad in excess, <laughs> including listen to some old coot in Idaho drone on about weeds. <laughs> All right. Um, Amy Teal, I healed a huge hole in my leg with Comfrey Sav, had plantain in it. Yeah, Comfrey and plantain are made for each other. Really great. So glad that wound healed up. That, that it works. You know, if you just had Comfrey and plantain on a wound, fantastic. If you want to kill some bugs, put some calendula in it. All done. I mean, it's amazing. All right. Okay. Jeannie says, I guess huge doses of common sense are needed when taking care of your health. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's try a little of that. That'd be good. <laughs> good thinking. Mitch says, I have rheumatoid arthritis for seven years. No meds manage the pain. Uh no meds, period. Manage the pain via diet, 95% carnivore. I still have minor med, have minor to med pain most, oh, minor to medium, I guess as he's saying, pain most days. Tried burdock powder. It caused me some terrible pain. Why? I don't know why the burdock caused you pain. That's very unusual. Burdock is usually one of my first grabs for helping with arthritis. Um, but everybody's allowed to be different. And if something does something to you you don't like, don't take it. But I've never, that's the first comment or thing I've ever heard negative about burdock on any scale. So you might have some, maybe there's some low grade allergic thing to burdock and it's causing some inflammation and in which you didn't need, you know, um, that would be my guess. Um, and as to the carnivore diet for decreasing inflammation, yeah, you bet. And I'm not saying we all ought to go out and be carnivores, but one of the principal causes of inflammation is refined carbohydrates. So be a carnivore that eats lots of green leafy vegetables. Do that. Okay. 
but don't be a carnivore that eats a baked potato with your steak because that really will flare you up. Okay, your body can't tell a baked potato from cotton candy. Simple carbs are stimulate insulin. Insulin is super inflammatory. That's another two-hour webinar. Uh, we talk about that in the school too a lot. Uh, so yeah, simple carbs and sugars and processed foods are very inflammatory. If you have arthritis or an autoimmune disease, back way off of those. Eat real vegetables and real proteins and not processed junk and not simple carbs. Okay. Amy, I guess it's Amy. Maybe it's Amye. I don't know. Teal says she loves learning about this stuff. Well, we have love learning about it too. Okay. Um, Okay, I gotta figure out where I went here. All right, there we go. Um, more tips on highlighting and stuff. Is comfrey salve help for, for psoriasis? Yeah, you bet. I make a lotion that has comfrey. What's in that lotion? Comfrey marshmallow. It's got some calendula. Who else is in there? Comfrey marshmallow calendula. I think that's all that's in there. Maybe it's got some chickweed, so it's not itchy. Anyway, just a comfrey salve. But certainly, uh, we have a lotion kit. Uh, it's called Save Your Skin Lotion. You can go buy that, and it's got all the ingredients and instructions, and it's a cute little box, and it's fun. It's like you're getting a present in the mail. It's it's pretty, my because I have girls that work for me, which is smart. <laughs> anyway, the the... I don't even know what it's called, the essential lotion experience or something, but one of them is save your skin, but that's what it is. It's, it's comfrey, marshmallow, calendula, and chickweed. Um, but yeah, they're very soothing to the psoriasis and they help heal the skin. That's good. And they are anti-inflammatory. That's good. The biggest thing you can do for psoriasis or eczema is make your liver happy because almost always eczema and psoriasis are, are a result of liver overwork or insufficiency or toxicity. Um, so if you took some burdock internally and put the salve on or some liver support formula or liver builder formula, or both of those probably improved your diet, took all the nasty, artificial junky stuff out of your diet, uh, took some liver support herbs internally to support your liver's normal function and put that lotion on you, a comfrey lotion or one of those guys that would, I've had a tons of eczema and psoriasis cases and it really cleans up. There's a couple of more new members. So sweet. We so appreciate you guys doing that. Thank you very much. All right. Um, okay. Laurie says, no offense, but carnivore is not a regenerative diet. Your body needs soothing and hydration. Well, absolutely. Don't just eat meat, guys. Okay. Like I said, be a carnivore who eats a ton of vegetables. That's, <laughs> that's my advice. Excess in anything is a bad idea, right? Uh, so yeah okay Anne says hi from tasmania i love comfrey and use it for hammer toes it actually took the pain and swelling down in hours yeah it's really good for inflammation and how fun that you're in tasmania i think you're our first tasmanian <laughs> that's great i don't know if i have any students in tasmania i've got some on the big island but i don't have any in tasmania it's not an island it's a continent it's an australia continent i hope i didn't offend any aussies down there I'm sure it's a very nice continent, guys. It's not an island. <laughs> anyway, um, all right. Okay. Amy says, yeah, comfrey plantain, cleanse salve, heal psoriasis. Absolutely. Yep, said that too. Comfrey, Linda says, comfrey's a cell regenerator, so it's, yeah, so it'll help psoriasis. That's right. Everybody's saying smart things to her about her psoriasis, and I agree. Okay. Mitch says that the carnivore thing is really the only thing that's helping him. And I say, if that's helping you, that's good. Eat some spinach with it though. Okay. Um, all right. Here's some more psoriasis in Germany. Yeah. What we just said is also true for Germans. Um, Okay. Psoriasis is also dietary, Amy says, and that's true too, again, for the same reasons. Simple carbs, increased inflammation, uh, bad diet, leaky gut, psoriasis, you know, anyway, clean up your diet, 
and uh, make your liver happy and psoriasis and slap some comfrey lotion on it and psoriasis will get lots better. Um, Susan Weed's been drinking comfrey tea for many years regularly. Thus, my irregular, irregular dose doesn't worry me in the least. Chopped a lot, dye drying some for making more salve. Yep, you bet. Ir, ir, infrequent use as a medicinal is fine. I wouldn't use it long term every day in large high doses. That would. There's other things you can do uh, that are less risky than that. Truffle Snuffle says, I killed my comfrey. I planted some artichoke in the same bed. And the artichoke must have liked the comfrey so much that it killed it. <laughs> well, for rude, <laughs> that nasty, grumpy artichoke killing your good comfrey. The good news is artichoke's an herb, too, so you're okay. It's, a good... <laughs> it's good for respiratory stuff. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's funny. Okay. RK says that artichokes are a good pesticide, too. Bugs don't like it. Or is she saying comfrey's a good pesticide? I don't know. Somebody's a good pesticide. Um, busy girl says it helps eczema. That's absolutely true. Um, Sabrina says you guys in the chat are awesome. The wealth of info and kindness is so soothing. You know what? That is so true. You people, I love herb people, the sweetest people in the world. You know, on the, in the school, we have a student forum and what a beautiful community. I mean, they're just the nicest people and somebody will put a question on and you'll get 10 people telling our great things. That's why the other reason I give people lifetime access to the school so they can keep coming to the farm and being smart and helping people. <laughs> you know, we get this in tremendous resource of, of people and there's doctors and nurses and, you know, chiropractors and naturopaths and people that have graduated from the school a hundred years ago and people that have graduated from other schools a hundred years ago. It's a great community, great resource. And it's really great to get together and learn fun things. Okay. Um, more talk about salves that work and it's all the same ones we've been saying. Okay. Uh, Megan Taylor, thank you very much. You are making jumping into herbalism as a much less daunting task to take on. Don't know why or when it would be okay to ask about another plant. Go ahead and ask. We don't care. And if you don't get it to it tonight, shoot me an email. Okay. You know, herbalism doesn't have to be hard. Learning about herbs doesn't have to be rocket science. We don't have to make it complicated. Um, we can learn lots of tremendous things. Uh, and I'll tell you what, if any of you are smart enough to drive an automobile, you can be a great herbalist. It's not rocket science. Okay. But if you're not smart enough to drive an automobile, or if you're smart enough not to drive an automobile, you can also be a great herbalist. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks for putting it together. Okay. Here's one last question. Then we probably better cut it out. Um, um, Terry says, since comfrey has amazing growth properties, does it cause cancer to grow rapidly if taken internally? I would not use comfrey on a cancer case. And I'm sure for some cancers, Comfrey's probably anti-cancer. You know, you could probably find that study on Google Scholar. But it also makes cells divide faster. And I would bet money, just anecdotally from my own understanding of things, I think putting on a tumor is a really bad idea. Okay, uh, let's do other things for cancer. All right. Um, okay. Who did? Okay. Um, all right. There's the cancer thing. We did that. What? Here? Yeah. Oh. Oh, there it is. Um, Hawkins Hills. Oh, she donated five dollars. Thank you. That's very sweet. Maybe it's a he. I don't know. Are Hawkins those boys or girls? I don't know. Uh. There's probably both kinds of Hawkinses. There's lots of different kinds of Joneses. Um, is Boswellia safe to use long term? Yeah, in in correct doses, uh, we have a I have a formula called Joint Support that has Boswellia in it and some other great anti-inflammatories. Um, and I've used it long term on lots of cases for lots of years, and it doesn't seem to bother anybody. Um, so yeah, you bet. Um, okay, very good. Let's scroll down here. 
Woodsy says, I'm an hour late. Is it recorded to watch later? You bet. It's recorded. It'll be on YouTube forever. Um, Linda Ray says, in my personal research, I read Comfrey regenerates healthy cells, but not unhealthy cancerous cells. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I would be cautious with that. And like I said, I'm sure that some things it won't bother. You know, cancer is wildly complex. People say, what's good for cancer? And I say, which one? Because there's a thousand of them and they all behave differently. Okay. So I would say in general, just as a general th thought, I probably wouldn't use it on a cancer case. There's other things you can, what are you going to use it for in a cancer case? There's other people that do things Comfrey does that would have no risk of making the cancer grow faster. Let's do that instead. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Cindy Kerr says, as a student, there's a community there where we all learn and share together. Yep, we'd love to have you all join the school. Let's do that. Um, Janice says she uses Comfrey in the homeopathic form. So that's fun too. Okay. Plantain for bee stings. RK is talking about, yep, make a spit, chew up some plantain leaf, put it on the bee sting, it'll go away. Okay, let's see. All right. Um, okay, I think we better be done. I'll tell you what I'll do, though. Um, if you have a question that didn't get answered, because we just need to wrap up so people can go to bed and stuff. Um, <laughs> some of you New Yorkers are probably really tired. Anyway, um, East Coasters. If your question didn't get answered, shoot me an email. And I'll also go... Uh, through these on the YouTube thing and put them in the comments. Okay. Put your questions down there and I'll ask answer questions too. So anyway, um, we need to wrap up. I want to tell you, thanks a million for coming tonight. So appreciate your support. So appreciate your curiosity and your enthusiasm for learning and helping people. Um, if you enjoyed this, click the little like button. And if you would like to enjoy another one, click the little subscribe button. Um, and if you would like to enjoy learning a lot about herbs, from some crazy veterinary nature path wackadoodle in Idaho, sign up for the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. We would love to have you there. You have lifetime access. It's absurdly cheap for what it is. Most programs that are even close to our level of content are eight or 10 times more money. Okay. And the reason ours is as inexpensive as it is, is because I'd rather make half a dozen herbalists than one. Okay. So go to homegrownherbalist.net. There's lots of blog articles. There's lots of other videos here on our YouTube channel that you can enjoy. There's lots of flies buzzing around my studio that you can enjoy. Uh, we'll get close-ups of those later and make a video. Anyway, <laughs> Doc Jones here from the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. Thanks for watching and have a great day.